All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you uh, for the wonderful dinner you provided and the privilege of uh, studying your word together, studying you. Uh, God, to know you uh, is our highest joy. Yes. Scripture says to know Jesus is eternal life. Uh, so we ask that you would that you would make this a life giving uh, endeavor tonight. Yes, Lord. Lord we uh, ask you to cleanse us of every sin and distraction, plus everything that's going on here in our campus. Fill us with your Spirit. Yes. Uh, Lord, again, we remember Ukraine and pray for peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, pray, God, I pray that you'd remove Vladimir Putin from mm -hmm. office. Yes. Uh, and uh, I do ask you to save him. But Lord, I, I pray that mm -hmm. you would turn from this course and that uh, you'd uh, rescue lives. Thank you for all the stories we've already heard of bravery and even what, what sounds like miracles uh, that, that may be taking place there, Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, we pray that you do wonderful things. I thank you for the unity that yes, you've given Father, so you. much of the rest of the world. Um, I just ask that uh, you would uh, bring an end to the fighting. Uh, bless our evening. Speak to bless. us and, and uh, be honored in our response to who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so last week, I didn't get to finish. Oh, wait, before I forget, Nancy. Um, Nancy uh, Wilson put this up on the board for us. Jim Fitzpatrick, long time member of our church, lives in Franklin, uh, Tennessee now. Uh, his 90th birthday, wow, that's my mom's birthday, so I won't forget that one. Uh, she's not 90, but uh, <laughs> so don't tell her I said that. But, <laughs> uh, but this is a surprise, so please don't say anything to Jim. Uh, and uh, but they're cult they're asking is there a certain day they're supposed to send them because I guess that wouldn't be a surprise if somebody's birthday or about his birthday okay. sending a birthday party it would mean a lot to him yeah yes that's Jill's birthday too yeah. oh well, there you go March 18th it's a good day um so uh, happy early birthday Jill so um yeah so I guess you, the, the surprise is the fact that we're you know coordinating it um but I just want to put that up there for you there's the address in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, and uh, if you were here when um, Amy Heinrichs spoke a few months ago, she she's the one who works at a, a missionary hospital in um, Ethiopia. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's yeah. Soto Christian Hospital. And um, that's Jim's daughter. Mm -hmm. So Amy fits under her. Amy yeah, <clears throat> that's right. That's the same family. Okay. That, All right. So last week, wait, did I have a question? Rex, you say something? I was just, is that planned for a certain day? Uh, what, what Nancy put up here is uh, Jim's address. His birthday is March 18th, and they're just asking if people are able to to send him a card through the mail. Um, oh. he's, turning, he's turning 90 on the 18th. Okay. We may be up there, so I may just go see him but on the 18th. There you go. Even better. Even better. Okay, so last week, um, I didn't get to walk through uh, th these uh, incommunicable attributes of God. Tonight, I, I don't know that we'll finish all of this tonight either, um, but uh, so let's see who uh, can remember. What did we say it means uh, that some of God's attributes are incommunicable? What does that mean? This is the test, you know, the pop quiz part. Ineffable. 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 What's that? We can't have these attributes. We can have yes. them. We can imitate some of the other ones, but we can't have these. Right. So let's try it. So incommunicable attributes of God are attributes that he does not share with his creation. We can't possess these in, in any measure. <laughs> um, the communicable attributes, by just you know, by understanding what in, you know, in being a negator, communicable means that it can be shared, right? Um, so we'll talk about those second. Um, and so I'm going to give you some examples here. This is a pretty comprehensive list of what we could call the incommunicable attributes of God. This first one is probably the most confusing, so we're just going to get out of the way uh, right off the bat. <laughs> uh, and this is not something uh, that you hear talked about a lot in churches, it's even hard to pin it down to a particular verse of the Bible. But a lot of theologians, and, and I would hold to this, they believe that there is a simplicity of God. Now, let me clarify. Sometimes we use the word simple in a derogatory way, right? Oh, he's so simple-minded, or, you know, uh, he's a simpleton. We obviously do not mean that. Uh, we don't mean he's uncomplex either, because, you know, God is way beyond our ability to understand. 
We don't mean he lacks intelligence. Obviously, we don't mean those things. Michael Horton in his book on theology is called Pilgrim Theology. He defines it this way. As infinite spirit, God is not made up of different parts. His attributes are identical with his being. That's one way to understand the simplicity of God. And by that, we mean that uh, God is, is, is one whole being. He can't be divided into parts. He's totally consistent with himself. Um, uh, Greg Allison has this definition as well in, in his book that I'm using. God is his attributes. That's what they mean by the simplicity of God. He's not comprised of parts with his characteristics like holiness, love, and power being ingredients of which he is made, right? Additionally, God is not a divine nature to which are added the perfections of knowledge, eternity, and justice. Rather, God is his nature, and he is his attributes. So just kind of my understanding of this. God is not an abstract idea, right? He is a being who is love. That's an example of one of his attributes. Right? He is a being who holds every one of his attributes in full measure. There's a simplicity to that. Um, it's not that he's more of this or, you know, like, for example, me, um, <laughs> like uh, my memory is, is highly, uh, it, it has a lot of variation in what I'm good at remembering. And my wife probably, you know, have lots to, you know, add to this. Like, I'm really good at remembering parts of history and dates and, you know, people from history and, and people's faces. I'm, I'm generally pretty good at that. I'm really terrible at remembering like to take out the garbage or something like that. Or <laughs> I, we've actually found out that I, I really flush bad uh, memories. <laughs> like Christy will bring something up. Like, remember when this person said that to you? I have no memory of that. But it happened to me and she remembers it and I've forgotten so, so I, maybe that's a good, good, you know, thing to forget those things, right? Uh, that's pretty different. Thanks, Watch Super. Yeah, thank you, right? <laughs> you know, don't worry, be happy, right? Okay. So uh, uh, it's not everything, obviously, but there's just something that I just don't keep up here. Um, I'm not consistent in that, right? There's there's a, a breakdown in, in my ability to remember things. I don't know if that's a good illustration, but God doesn't. He, he's not inconsistent, good at some things, bad at others. Uh, in, uh, he doesn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed in a bad mood. He's, he's always fully all of his attributes. He's one being unified, not divided into different parts. He's never in conflict within himself. We do that, right? Like we, oh man, what should I do? Uh, you know, how should I handle this? Because I love this person. I want to help them out. But wisdom tells me I might be, you know, enabling them in a bad decision or, you know, just examples of the kind of things that we wrestle through. God doesn't have those internal wrestlings. Um, he's fully consistent. Um, let me see here. Now, I will say there are passages um, where God will talk about kind of an emotional struggle that he has. But I think, again, as I've said earlier, those passages are presenting God in a way that humanity can understand. Um, he's showing us his heart in those. We're not saying those passages are false, just that we should understand them as they are and in the context of the rest of scripture. God is never inconsistent. He's never out of balance. He's never in a bad mood. Simplicity of God. Second one, you could call it God's independence. Uh, the fancy theological word is aseity. It's not a word we use very often. Uh, and I'll give you an example of a passage for this. If you have your Bibles, you may want to uh, look over to Exodus 3. This is one that I can really pin down on a passage. Exodus, this is the burning bush where uh, God is telling Moses to go back and lead his people out of slavery in Egypt. And Moses really argues with God a lot of different ways. And finally, at the end, the Lord is, he gets frustrated. Um, because Moses is doubting the Lord and disobeying, really. Exodus 3.13, then Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they asked me, what is his name? What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Or some translations say, I am that I am, right? I think it could even be translated, I will be who I will be. You can see it's all centers around uh, this, this concept of uh, you know, existence or being, right? Um, you know, we talk about being verbs. You know, he is, am. That the, the Hebrew verb for that is, it's hayah, is the verb. 
And you may hear in there how we can get the name for God, Yahweh. Okay, that name for God is related to the Hebrew verb to be, which is manifested in this verse. When God says, I am who I am, that's, he, that's what he says his name is. Uh, this is what you were to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So as I look at that passage, I think kind of in a general sense, you can understand that, that God is telling Moses and Israel that he will be whatever they need. But I think it's, 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 it's not the main thrust of it. I think it has to do with the fact that God exists in himself. He defines himself. He communicates himself in the way he desires and he will be worshiped as he prescribes and so on. Yeah, he is not dependent upon anyone or anything else. He has always existed. He will always exist. And his existence is not, uh, you know, derivative from anything else. Uh, he's completely self-sufficient, self-existent. Are we self-existent? No. He had to choose to make us. He had to choose to make the universe in which we live, to say, let there be light, and, and to put form us out of the dust of the ground and put his breath in our nostrils. There wasn't ever a moment like that for God. He always existed, which kind of hurts our brains a little bit, because the further you go back, he existed before that and before that. And the reality is, when you think about the universe, um, <clears throat> you know, we're used to the chain of cause and effect, right? And everything that you see in the world, we can say, well, that was caused by this. And you, so, you, so you start going backwards in the cause and effect chain. When you get back to creation, <laughs> and, and there had to have been a first cause. This is uh, theologians, philosophers, often will refer to God as the first cause, or they'll use this term, the prime mover. Uh, and there's an argument for God's existence. In, you know, what do we mean when we say the cosmos? That's not a bad word. I know Carl Sagan kind of used that, and we, we don't like his worldview, but <clears throat> what's the cosmos mean? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's everything, right? Space, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm saying it kind of the Greek way, cosmos, sorry. Uh, there is an argument for God's existence called the cosmological argument for God's existence. And it basically says this, there had to have been a first cause that's outside of all the other causes. Because otherwise we just keep going back and where's the beginning? Right, there has to have been something that sort of exists outside of that chain of cause and effect events for there to be anything at all. Get some blank stares. Yeah. There's some of you, something got distorted. Something, yeah, there had to be something that started everything, but that something had to be outside of the normal cause and effect, you know, events that we're used to, or we just have to keep going back further. And where, where does it? There has to be something that's outside of the normal uh, way in which we're used to things happening, uh, or, or we can never get back to the beginning. Uh, I don't know if I'm explaining that very well right now. Um, but this, this argument basically says there has to have been something that started everything, and God's really the only thing that fits in that category. <laughs> I mean, universes don't create themselves. Planets can't make themselves come into being. There has to have been something outside of the normal universe to have started all of this. And, and the argument is the thing that most uh, logically fits that is God. Or, um, and it's, a, it's an argument not for the whole gospel. It's just an argument for the existence of a God. For the universe having come from an outside origin <laughs> that is not part of the natural world, if I could use that, that phrase. Um, so God exists in himself. Um, he's not dependent on anything else for his existence. He will never go out of existence. God has no needs. God doesn't lack anything. And not even a relationship. You might think, well, was he lonely? No, he had the Trinity. <laughs> There's three persons in one. He wasn't lonely. Matt, we yes. have... I mean, we, we believe in God, 
Uh -huh. But in other religions, have you studied, uh, like, do they believe that, who do they believe started the? Uh, How do they explain that? Yeah, so <coughs> they well, have such bad, uh, I didn't say that, not bad gods, but gods that came from humanity. So, How do the, they explain well, the that? argument that I just gave is an argument just for theism which means right, there is right. a God, right? right? So a lot of other religions could actually fit with that, right? Because there's lots of other religions that believe in a God. Islam, and, you know, Hinduism has lots of gods. Um, Buddhism would be one. Uh, I think there are strains of Hinduism that don't believe in a God, but there's lots of strains of it. Uh, I believe Buddhism, if I'm remembering right, they don't technically believe in a God, but for, for as I look at that worldview, I think, their God is sort of this reincarnation system. Buddhism seems to be more of a philosophy. Than a yeah, religion. that's a good point. Yeah, the denial of desires. Yeah. Um, so I guess maybe to answer your question, there are some that would be, in fact, I think there are some Muslim theologians who have given that same argument that I just gave. Because remember, I said it's not the same thing as saying the gospel, right? and I wouldn't subscribe to their worldview. But I would agree there is a God who created the universe, right? That doesn't mean they're Christian. That doesn't mean they're going to heaven. But there is a lineup in terms of understanding if there it was a creator. So in African traditional religions, there is a supreme being. You don't get to him, but there is a supreme being. Yeah, out there somewhere. Yeah, that. thank you for that perspective. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say most cultures in the world, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but most cultures in the world are not atheistic, you know what I mean, uh, even today. Um, uh, it's probably on the rise, I know, definitely in Europe, um, but, uh, and probably in this country too, but generally a lot of people have some idea of a supreme being or a god or something or a collection of gods. And you go back to mythology, you know, the Greek yeah. mythology, they have they had the, all these stories of the demigods and all these, you know, these different legends about how creation, sometimes creation came about through a war between the gods or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's, there's a, a lot of cultural consistency, a lot of consistency cross-culturally with that. If most people believe there is a being a god, does, does Robert also, most of the others believe there's a devil? Is uh, they have to flip that or just they're, they're not? It's really hard to generalize about a lot of them. I, I would say like in Buddhism, you know, the, the desire, you know, would be kind of the, the bad guy or the evil force. Um, Hinduism, I think, has literally thousands of gods, and I think some of them are evil. Um, I don't know that they would see them in kind of this, you know, oppositional structure like we were like, here's the good and here's the bad. I don't know that they would see it that way. Um, and I don't know. Does this all believe in Satan? I can't answer that question. Because everything emanates from God. God, if Allah wills, whether it's yeah. good or bad, it's his will. So I don't really talk so much about yeah. Satan. In African traditional religions, you have good spirits and evil spirits. Yeah. But so they're I, good and bad. I don't know if they talk about hell. I don't know. Yeah, Billy. Um, I like the new seven, but it was like last night, I say the other night before, I was by, by myself in the living room. And I went to God in prayer. It, it, I didn't have anything petition really, just went to the Lord and he's like, Well, here I am. So I was like, Well, that puts a smile on my face and I moved on. I didn't have anything like they fan prayer about it. He's here, and then it's all the same, you know. You can go in put him anytime, all that other stuff going on, not really need anything. Mm -hmm. But he's there. I mean, he's yep. something, but it wasn't anything to it. So it's just like when you, your parents tell you there's a God you can pray to, and you just you go to the God. It wasn't about Jesus, Holy Spirit, all the, all the things spelled out in, in, mm -hmm. in the Holy Bible. But just, if you just go, if you go in the right spirit, you don't have, have to have something to say. Say, one God, and he's like, well, here I am. And 
It wasn't really World War III. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a, it's a real relationship. I was good to hear yeah. he answered, and I'm like, moving on from there. Right. Well, it's a real relationship, and and uh, you don't you don't have to have something earth shattering to say just to commune with God in prayer. Yeah. Yep, and always uh, the, Jesus is the one who gives us access to him like that. It's our high priest. All right, number three. Uh, this is, is sort of related to the one I just talked about. The ne- God is a necessary being, his necessity. I, and I've touched on this some of the other weeks. Um, and, and here's a passage I'll give you on that. Re- Revelation 1.8. Um, at the beginning of Revelation, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. It says the Lord God, the one who is, who, I'm sorry, who is, who was, and who is to come. It's interesting. He does present, past, and then future. The Almighty. Everything has come from him. Uh, and, and you could say it this way. God cannot not exist. I know that's a double negative. Uh, but the point is, he cannot, you could say it this way. He cannot fail to exist. For anything at all to exist, God himself must exist. We are what philosophers would call contingent beings, meaning is that we can fail to exist. There could be a possible universe in which I don't, I'm not here. There can't be a possible universe in which God isn't here, or there is no universe. Uh, our existence is contingent upon his. We derive our existence from the great I am. Okay, number four, God is immutable. Who knows what that means? You guys know that. It's printed in the first part, <laughs> opening part of the Gideon Bible, I guess. It's kind of a scary word. What's, yeah, what's it mean? Unchanging. Unchanging, right? He does not mutate. Yeah, that's a, good, that's, a, that's a great way to remember that, yeah. He doesn't mutate. He doesn't change in any way. Malachi 3.6 says it this way. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. It says, because I, the Lord, have not changed, you descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. <laughs> Because God is consistent in his love and grace and kindness, they've survived. Uh, Hebrews 13, 8, you may be familiar with that. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? He does not change. That's really, really good news for us. His character is always the same. And think of it this way. He's completely holy. He's completely perfect. So God never grows uh, in, his, uh, in his knowledge. He never grows in his character, he also never shrinks in those because they're both fully perfect, fully developed. Uh, he's perfect and, and complete in his knowledge and his character. God never improves. There, there's no possible way to improve upon God, right? He, or he also doesn't go backwards and get worse at something, right? He never fails to live in perfect consistency with his own full character. He is immutable. Number five, God is eternal. Eternity of God. Again, Revelation 1 8, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Uh, Daniel 7, this is a very, very important Old Testament passage. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Anybody know what Jesus' most commonly used title for himself was in the Gospels? Son of David. Close. Son of man. Son of man. Son of David is there a lot. Son of man is the most commonly used title that Jesus gave for himself. And it links to this passage, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I continued, Daniel says, I continued watching in the night visions and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days. That's that's the phrase I'm actually getting at for this. Uh, He approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. Sounds like Revelation. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Sorry, so the, the Ancient of Days, who I think is the father in this passage, is ancient going backwards, but he and the son, they have a dominion that's everlasting going forward, right? That will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So actually, the title Son of Man, I think it actually conveys Jesus' humanity and divinity, because obviously Son of Man, that we understand his humanity there, um, but because of passages like this one, we understand that it's it's much more than that. The Son of Man coming before the Ancient of Days and being given a kingdom forever. It's a prophecy of Jesus' eternal rule. And this passage will be the one quoted at Jesus' trial, or at least referenced at Jesus' trial. You remember when Jesus finally spoke up at his trial? Why did he finally speak up when he was on trial? The high priest puts him under oath. 
And by the Old Testament law, he has to answer. Remember, Jesus kept every aspect of the Old Testament law. And Leviticus, I forget the passage off the top of my head, but Leviticus says, when the high priest puts you, adjures you, right? Puts you under oath, you have to answer. And so he, the, the, the high priest says to Jesus, you know, are you, are you the, the son of God, essentially? And Jesus says, you, you said so, and you will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power. He references this text. That's a mic drop moment right there. Um, and the high priest gets it. He gets the reference, and that's when he says it's blasphemy. Of course, we know it's not blasphemy. It's the truth. Yeah. He is the one he's claiming to be Father. And you know the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, he used that a lot too. Son of man, yes. son of man, son of man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's used as a title for Ezekiel quite a bit in the, in the book. Yeah. That God addresses him that way. Yes. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, so he's, he's immutable. He's eternal. Um, God transcends time. He has existed in eternity past before creating the universe. He will also exist forever into the eternal future after this universe is destroyed. Uh, he knows the future. He controls the future. And he's not limited by time in the way that we are. He's not limited in any way. Okay, uh, number six, God's omnipresence. What's that mean? Oh, Harry, go ahead. One more on five. How, how would you define eternity if God was in eternity before you made the universe? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's a little bit hard to know. Like, did God have some sense of a succession of moments? Is that what you're saying? Like, was time created? I, I can't comprehend. Yeah, me neither. Uh, before... Yeah, and, and some people say, like, I think even some of our songs, one of our songs is Time Will Be No More. One of our, it's a hymn. I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm not sure that I agree with that. Time will be no more. No, 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 no. The rolls call up the honor. Yeah, thank you. I still sing that song. I'm not fully cutting that song. But in the book of Revelation, there's even a spot where John says there was silence for half an hour. He's talking about in heaven. Now, maybe that's John's perspective because he's, you know, seeing this vision still as an earthly human. I don't know. But, but I actually think, I think we probably will have some experience of time passing in heaven. I don't think it'll be the same. I don't think we're going to be like, bored. I've been here two billion years. And, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I think there's going to be so much depth about God that we're understanding. And I think he's going to give us, I think we're going to have work to do in heaven. I don't mean tedious labor, but I, there's responsibility because Jesus says in the gospels, forget the passage, but he says, um, if you cannot be trusted with riches, you know, in this life that aren't yours, how will you be trusted with the true riches that, you know, that last forever? I think is what he's saying. I think there's a stewardship even in heaven. Um, and I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm, it's going to be far better than anything we've had here. It's not going to be boring. Uh, we're not going to be wondering what's next, you know, because time is just dragging on. It's not going to be that at all. But I still think we may have some, I, I don't think we're going to like have a moment and then forget you know what I mean? Where somebody's like, hey, remember what happened? We won't have days and nights. I'm not making a lot of sense here, but like, I don't think we're going to forget things that happened prior because we won't have any concept of time. I, I just think that's how it's going to work. I don't um, think there'll be a calendar. Yeah, I, I don't think we're going to be limited like that. Like, oh, I got to get to such, such, such a place or, um, you know, running out of time on something. I, I don't think that's going to be the reality, but I do think it, there'll probably be some kind of succession of moments that we're used to, you know, just because we're experiencing things and we'll experience, I think, lots of new things in heaven, you know? I mean, people, I think we have such a limited concept of heaven mm -hmm. because of our culture and, and just weird things that have sort of crept into our thoughts about it. Well, God- Leave the universe and, and enter eternity. Yeah, but- has anybody in here read Last Battle by C.S. Lewis, the last book in the Chronicles of Narnia? Mm -hmm. oh, You've got to read it. Um, read the whole series. Yeah, read, yeah, yeah. Don't don't jump to that book. Read the whole series. No. Um, and and uh, and you got to do it in the right order. So ask me the right order because some of the publishers put it in the wrong order. Um, <laughs> but I think I'll explain this about. I'll say it this way, in that, and, and Lewis isn't saying like that this is definitely how heaven's going to be, but his vision of, of heaven in that story, where the characters end up going to like heaven in their world, which uh, it's, it's England and, you know, 
that's our planet, but they're in Narnia and they go back and forth, all this kind of stuff. But in his understanding of heaven, it's like all the places on this earth are there, but in their true form. The mountains are higher. Everything's more beautiful. Like Plato's cave, cave. Yeah, it is similar to Plato's cave. Yeah, that's a good reference. Yeah. Um, nice philosophical reference there, Billy. Um, Plato's cave is this understanding that, you know, all that we see are shadows. You know, Plato talked about the fire, uh, being the light being behind us, and all we see is sh shadows on the wall of this cave. Um, but uh, I, th I love Lewis's vision of that. It's like there's a, you know, he's from England, characters are from England, and they go to heaven. It's like it's the true England, and it's so much better. And, you know, <laughs> just a good example of the dark glass we look at. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I don't, he, Lewis is not making the claim that that's what heaven is. But I like the idea that the same, you know, he's God said he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Mm -hmm. So there may be a lot more parallels than we think, mm -hmm. um, just without sin. And, and I think way better. <laughs> uh, if, if, if God can make a world that we enjoy this much, even in spite of sin, I, I, I have, I'm very confident that heaven's going to be, you know, beyond our ability to imagine this, as, as Paul says. So I think it's going to be so amazing and but it'd be so much different what any of us even yeah, think about yeah. that we're going to be amazed and surprised continually that there's there'll be no room for boredom. Yeah. Because we will just be continually amazed and surprised and in awe of what yeah. we can't none of us can even begin to imagine. I mean Amen. revelation doesn't Amen. even yeah, even what you read there, you <laughs> begin to touch it. C.S. Lewis, I'm a nobody. I don't oh, know. Oh, no, yeah, else. you're right. Yeah, and I and I, I think a lot about the uh, the streets of gold, yeah. and it's like you know what we value one of our most prized um, you know materials here on this earth. It's like pavement up there, you know, <laughs> and I, and I don't. I, I think John's making a point to say like it, it's just so much more than you can imagine, even by saying that, you know. Fast. Yes. When Paul was taken up to the third heaven, he said he seen things unspeakable. Yeah. And I mean, my little information, I can't even fathom how great heaven is really going to be. I can't. And just think about eternity. Yeah. See, here why I'm here on earth, some kind of way, I'm used to, it's going to come to end some kind of way. Right, right. But I can't fathom something that has no end. Yeah. You, you follow yeah. me? And it, to me, when I think about it, it's mind blowing. And as he would just say, I mean, heaven is going to be so great. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Border game in your mind. You in the presence of God. We're gonna yeah. be in his very presence. That's what makes it heaven. Thank you. Being That's with God. You, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think of, I think sometimes, like for me, there's a temptation to get distracted by all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know we're gonna have that. It's gonna be wonderful to be with our loved ones and, and all that. And I don't want to diminish any of that, but I think the thing that's going to make heaven what it is is being in God's presence, yeah, right? So that, that's, that's the whole thing. Yeah, He's what we were built to run on, so to speak. You know what I mean? And he's what fulfills. And I heard it. people say that by going to see their loved ones, and I can humanly understand what they're saying, but then bring it back into the whole focus of thing. I want to see the one that died. Yeah. yeah. I would, you know. I, I can't think nobody I would die mm -hmm. And they done mistreated me, yeah. beat me all night. Right. But I love you so much, I'm going to do this to save you. Yeah. You, you, you know, that's the one I want to see. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be the best part by far. Um, we, we talked about uh, uh, Paul and his work, you know, Third Heaven. Mm -hmm. He's the same author who said things like, you know, having seen visions like that, that in comparison, it just doesn't hold a candle to even the sufferings that we go through, right? Um, the sufferings of this present, this present life are not worth comparing to the glory that will yeah. be revealed to us. And I, and I think even the suffering is going to be part of the glory, right? Because the Lord uses that to grow us. Uh, he, honor, he is honored when we walk through suffering and difficulty with faith. Like, so it's all going to result in this weight of glory, he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, I think. Um, that's just unfathomable, yeah, yeah. you know? And so it's not just going to be that it's wonderful. It's that it's going to, I think, in a sense, undo all the difficulties and sufferings of this life. Um, which, you know, 
it's good when you watch the news. That's that's a good word for us. <laughs> you know. Okay, let's see here. Um, omnipresence. What's that mean? Everywhere. Right. He's God is everywhere in full measure at all times. And one of the references for this is Second Chronicles. 618, which if I remember right, is from uh, Solomon's dedication of the temple in Jerusalem in his prayer. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 618 says, but will God indeed live on earth with humans? Even heaven, the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less the temple I've built. And so Solomon saying, yes, Lord, we want you to dwell amongst your people but I understand that you're not limited to this building. Even heaven itself cannot contain you, right? Uh, he is, and that doesn't mean like, you know, God has this like hulking body or something. Like, remember, he's a spirit, you know, and he, but he's everywhere in full measure at all times. Space does not limit God. Um, he does, however, I will say, I want to make this one clarification. God does demonstrate his presence in special ways in certain times and places. Right. Um, what are what are examples of that that you can think of? In the Bible, he stopped he stopped the sun or something. Okay. Yeah, he's showing his power uh, at that time when uh, uh, Joshua prayed, the sun and the moon stopped where they were. Yeah, he's he's manifesting himself. But think about it even more in terms of his presence in a particular time uh, or or event in the Bible. When the uh, children of Israel were was sad with Moses and said, you ain't the only one God talked to, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. He said, well, okay, y'all clean up. I'm paraphrasing now. Yeah. Clean your clothes up, wash up, and meet me here. Right. And then he, when he spoke to him, and after that, they told Moses, we don't want to hear this no more. From now on out, you come tell us what right. you're going to say. Right. He yeah. spoke to him, after, I think, was on that mountain. Yeah, well, yeah, God comes down on the mountain. Yeah. The mountain's quaking. That's referenced yeah. in Hebrews also. Um, where you know God's presence showed up in a special way on yeah. top of the mountain. That's a good example. What are some other examples? There's a lot around in Moses' story. The burning bush, right? Yeah. Right. God was not in Take your not in the whirlwind. Yeah. Yeah. The still small voice with Elijah. Yeah. Um, the burning bush. He even says, "Take your shoes off, or this place you're standing is holy ground." So God is there in some special way he's still omnipresent throughout the rest of the universe yeah. but he does show up in some time and place i'll give you another example go ahead when moses was wanted at, at, at the time him and moses had been talking so all at once moses now want to see who he's been dealing with yeah he said okay moses yeah come up to the rock and you can't see my face right but i'm gonna let you see my hand <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so you and he covers him over too yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's in the cleft of the rock. I think it's yeah. like Exodus 32, Exodus 33. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but he says, I'll, I'll show you my back. <laughs> you know, it's just, I would have loved to have seen it. Someday we will see the, his, his face, right? You know, um, but yeah, that's a great reference too, Bob. I, I also think about, um, you know, the pillar of fire, the cloud, uh, as he led the Israelites. A, a really important one is, in the tabernacle slash temple um, where God comes to dwell amongst his people in that special way, really on the top of the ark, which remember what the top of the ark is called? I mentioned this, I think, a few weeks ago. The top of the ark is called the mercy seat and they would sprinkle blood on it, which there's a gospel right there, <laughs> right? The only way that God's people can have him among them is by this offering of blood, which points us to Christ, mm -hmm. right? That sacrifice. So God would dwell amongst his people, almost like a throne on top of the ark and the tabernacle, and then later the temple. Uh, and that was a way, a special way in which he was amongst his people. It's also really significant. You mentioned Ezekiel a few minutes ago. In the book of Ezekiel, in the early chapters, you may remember this, the glory of the Lord departs Israel. Yeah. And it's yeah. this huge moment, this sad moment because of their sin. And then at the end of the book, the glory returns because God restores his people. Um, so <clears throat> those are, are really significant times where God is dwelling amongst his people in a special way. But I think we haven't even got to the most significant one yet. Well, Jonah <coughs> ran away and he got in the middle of the sea and he thought he was running away from yeah. God's presence. And said, no, I'm here to. Yeah. You can't run away from me. Yeah, and Jonah chapter two <clears throat> 
is a whole Thanksgiving prayer for. I used to, growing up, I thought of the fish as like punishment. Oh, you got swallowed by a fish. You read Jonah's prayer in chapter two, and Joe's rejoicing. He thought I was going to drown, and God provided this fish to rescue me. Uh, <coughs> sorry, I got some of my throat. And then Jacob wrestled with God. Oh yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, Genesis thirty-two, I think. Um, the big one is the incarnation of Jesus, right? That, that that to me, I think, is the most significant dwelling, special presence of God amongst His people. God in the flesh, right? <laughs> Coming down and dying for us. Um, but so none of that negates his omnipresence. We do know that he demonstrates his presence in a special way in certain times and places, but he is everywhere in full measure at all times. Uh, the big one of the other passages for this, I think it's uh, Psalm 139. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Uh, verse 7, where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, that's the abode of the dead in the Hebrew understanding. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I fly on the wings of the dawn and settle down on the western horizon, like the furthest edge of the world, even there your hand will lead me your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. He is everywhere in full measure. His power is not limited. The prophets will say, has the Lord's arm been shortened? <laughs> Can he not reach to every place? So uh, his omnipresence is tied to his omnipotence. Right, because his power can be fully exercised in every place as he is there. Okay, uh, number seven, God's perfection. God has no flaws. He has no errors. He makes no errors, makes no mistakes. Now, I mean, Genesis 6, scripture talks about God grieving or regretting his creation. But that doesn't mean he made a mistake, right? Uh, that's another one of those places where it's explaining God's emotions uh, in ways that we can understand and relate to. It doesn't mean he's saying, I shouldn't have done that. Um, he's, he's feeling the, the, the grief of our sin, which isn't a surprise to him, but he still feels it. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, and I hang the cattle on the foul. Yep. 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 He has no flaws. He has no lack. This, this is related to his independence that I talked about earlier. He doesn't need anything from us, um, but he is, he is fully perfect. Uh, number eight, this is one that we don't know as, that we don't talk about as much. God is impassable. Sometimes people understand this to mean that God does not have, they, they misunderstand this to mean that God does not experience emotions. That is not true. God does experience emotions. There's lots of scriptures to talk about that. Um, but what this, what this attribute of God says is that although God can suffer, he can experience suffering, it doesn't affect him like it does us. Suffering does not cause God to act wrongly or out of his character. You know, sometimes we, it's somebody, we can do really, really stupid things in the midst of great grief or being upset that really might not fit with our normal character. God does, never does that. <laughs> He's impassable, not in the sense of stoic and isn't affected by anything emotionally. He talks about, you know, don't grieve the spirit or, you know, Jesus wept or, you know, these sort of things. Uh, it just means that suffering does not cause him to act outside of his character, to act wrongly. It's not affected by it to that level. Number nine, uh, his, what you could call his infinitude, which means he's infinite. infinite. <clears throat> Unlike us, God has no limits. Now, God does self-impose limits, right? Can you think of an example? Stop there, Angel Jeff. I've seen enough. Okay. It's about uh, the... Um, I don't know. It's like... Yeah, you're talking with uh, David, the plague. Yeah. At the, at the end of David's reign, or near the end, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> let me give you an example. So, in Genesis, we talked about Many, many times I mentioned Genesis 3.15, where God promises, right after we sin, he promises to send, you know, one to crush the head of the serpent, right? 
prior to that, did God, did God have to save us prior to him saying that? Like did, could he have just, just, you know, wiped out Adam and Eve and been just in that? Yeah. So he had, he had no limits in that. But once he says, I'm going to provide redemption, he has to follow through on that because he's consistent with his character. He's faithful. He's true. So that's, that's the point I'm making is that God has no limits except where he gives limits on himself by making promises, right? So, so you could say, yes, could, could God, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of an example just off the top of my head. You know, could God just destroy the world with the snap of his hand, you know, fingers right now? Well, yeah, but that's not what it, the Bible says is going to happen. <laughs> I mean, well, eventually, I think he's going to, you know, new heavens and new earth, but I don't think all the prophecies and revelation have been fulfilled. He's going to follow through on that. So he has no limits on his power or his person other than the ones he self-imposes through his promises. And that's not a limit on his character. That's a limit on his actions that he's already, you know, he's, he's placed those there himself. Uh, one, one thing I just want to point out as an example of this in terms of the infinite nature of God. Just think about prayer. How many people think are praying to God right now? Right? Um, there was one, I'm trying to remember who this was. I can't remember off the top of my head. But there was one theologian that thought that the way God was able to listen to everybody's prayers at once was he used his control over time to just pause time and listen to one at a time. <laughs> I don't think he has to do that. <laughs> I think he can literally take them all in at the same time, you know, and, and respond in, uh, how he chooses. Um, but just that, I mean, there's probably you know, easily millions and millions of people praying right now. And he is listening to those. That's an aspect of his, or an example of, of his infinite nature being shown. So, what do you call it when you try to put human? Uh, characteristics on God, limitations. Yeah. That's the way works. So. Yeah, we do. Well, that's different, a different. He's a personal being, but different, different, different. Yeah. Uh, he is just, he's on another level beyond us. And, you know, sometimes people sort of get frustrated. I can't understand this about God. I can't understand that. But for me, that's, that's kind of comforting. If I could completely define and understand God, he yeah, he wouldn't be God, and he probably wouldn't be big enough to deal with all my problems and everybody else's problems, right? It's a good thing that he's beyond our ability to understand. Uh, you know, he says this, how unsearchable are his ways, you know, our past finding out. Um, so he's infinite. He's able to hear all of our prayers. He's able to you know, hold everything together. He knows and controls every single person and every animal and every molecule and electron. I mean, all the way down to that level. Scientists can't even pinpoint where electrons are as they're spinning around a nucleus. God not only knows that he's controlling that. Uh, some of the supercomputers we have in the world today, and I'm not familiar with them at all, but I know there are computers out there that can yeah. absorb billions yeah. of bits of data yeah. instantly. Uh -huh. And that's something we built. Yeah, that's now, a great we point. build something that can do that. <laughs> that's a good analogy. We can do a lot more than we can. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and you start reading about some of these stories about black holes and white holes and wormholes and you know, all this crazy stuff, you know, string theory and something that hurts my head in the first paragraph. I said, you, you can't, and you hear about some of these, what is it, uh, is it quasars that are like spinning around each other, these, these two stars, or this, and they're spinning super fast. And it's like, how does that even work? Um, and he came up with all that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And the prophet Isaiah, he had him to record to make it plain for us. My ways are not your ways. Yeah. My thoughts are not your thoughts. But my ways and thoughts are for the heaven to the earth. That, that's, that is Isaiah 55, I believe. Yeah, Bob. Yes, and that's, I'm glad you say that because that was in a book I was reading a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And he points out 
Listen to this. I didn't, I never noticed this connection before I read this in that book. It's, we'll close on this. That's a great, it's a good devotional thought. Thank you for bringing that up, Bob. He says, uh, Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. See, I, I forgot about the context. I thought it was only about, well, God's just higher than us. It is that, 100%. But to context, he says, let him return, this is verse 7, let him return to the Lord so he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will freely forgive. And that's when he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways. Yeah. So I think in like, as you put it all together, this author that I was reading, he was saying, we don't even have a, a, any, uh, we're not even close in understanding how forgiving and loving God is, Amen. right? You see that? Like, that's the context. Return to God. He'll have compassion. He'll forgive. I'm not like you people. <laughs> you, you, you take revenge. You fight each other, even though you're still sinning too. And yet he's never sinned. And that's how much his, his grace and compassion are to us. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm way higher than you. And yet I'm showing love and kindness. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So I, I, that's that's just a beautiful thing that even though he's infinite and high and above us, he's saying you don't even understand how gracious and forgiving I am. Uh, his love is beyond our ability to comprehend. Amen. So that's a, I think that's a good stopping point. Any uh, questions or comments? Got more early tonight. All right, Father, thank you for our, yes. our time, Lord. We we bow down in our hearts and we worship you, Lord. Uh, you are high and lifted up. You are holy, holy, holy. You are infinite. You don't need us. And yet you graciously decided to make us. And then when we turned away from you, you have provided forgiveness. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we're thankful for that, God. We're thankful that you are big enough and and you are infinite, and you hear every prayer, uh, and you are sovereign and in control of everything, and we can trust you with, with everyday things about our own lives. We can bring them to you and know that you are working and in control and working good for us, and we can trust you with the big thing, nations attacking one another uh, that we're all concerned about right now. God, that, you are no less in control of that than anything else, uh, and so uh, we rest in that and we trust in you, ask you to help us to, to let go of anxiety, cast our cares upon you because we know that you care for us yeah. and you can take it. You can handle all of it. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord, we praise you, ask you to bless us as we go Lord, and bring us back soon and safely. Mm -hmm. Bless our uh, the folks who have joined us online as well and uh, keep them safe also in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thanks everybody. Have a great night. Thanks for joining us, y'all. Thanks, Pastor. Good. Yeah.